Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Damiano Barona, and uh, he's pretty cool. I think this might be a first, and I always say this, is a first who's actually gotten his hands dirty, and he is an actual neurosurgeon that's working with uh, biohybrid interfaces, minimally invasive bioelectronics, the foreign body reaction, advanced spinal cord electronic interfaces. So it's pretty cool to be able to talk to somebody that uh, is actually on the front lines of uh, this neurosurgeon technology and neural implants. Dr. Barone, I introduced you a little bit. Do you want to introduce yourself better than I just did? Yeah, no, it actually was uh, to say more, more, than, more than perfect. It's, um, basically, I'm a practicing neurosurgeon in the United Kingdom. Uh, my base is at the University of Cambridge. Uh, although this year I'm doing one year of uh, super specialization in, in what you call the super specialization in Liverpool, where I'm uh, learning even more about say, implantable, implantable technology technologies. Okay, sounds good. And how did you get into this? What what kind of led you down to this specialization? It has been a long process, and um, to pra- uh, I mean, to practice as a neurosurgeon, you have to go through quite a bit of training. You have to go through medical school, then you have to go through general medical uh, postgraduate medical training, then you get to residency, where you spend something between six and eight years of in a program to become a neurosurgeon. And then if you have an academic interest, then they do an extra three to four years of a PhD program plus some more time as a postdoc. So it's this kind of a 20 years path to where I am at the moment. And a bit of serendipity, a bit of always been interested on the engineering side of things. Um, I've always been attracted by surgery because of the ability to treat patients but very quickly rather than waiting drug therapy that might take a long time. And then this, this, and the same attraction um, kind of um, uh, led me to implant of your technology. Everyone is uh, is aware of those uh, impressive videos of deep brain stimulation for Parkinson, where you switch a machine on and off, and the patient stops shaking. Yeah, that that is what led me to to where I am. Wow. Yeah, that's very interesting. Lots, lots of stuff to unpack there. But yeah, let's maybe first talk about the the pathway. So you said 20 years. So you're a what, like 40 or 45 to, before you even start working on this. So you have a 10 year career or something like that. that. That's pretty crazy. Did you know this when you were getting into it? Or did you just kind of follow your passion as it was coming? It, it's you kind of have an idea that and people will tell you look this is going to be a long process but in the, at the same time you you do things during your training it's not like um, uh, i mean medical school is mostly you read you follow the the attending around trying to learn as much as you can and you sit at the exams and that's fine that's like that's university but after that all the training after is still as a practicing physician you, you as a surgeon you still do operating at different levels of supervision depending on the level of training that uh, you're at so it's it's not one day they give you a certificate yes now you are a neurosurgeon and uh, you start practicing it's, it's kind of a progressive uh, uh, path so you don't get too frustrated in the journey because you practice while you do it okay yeah that's uh, yeah so maybe it's really only the medical school that's uh, quote-unquote boring and the rest is very entertaining <laughs> and then i guess neurosurgeon residents are very well known for not sleeping very much and being uh, overworked what's that like I, as somebody who loves my sleep what, what's it like to get i don't know only a few hours of sleep for years it's it's hard i mean it's um uh, i trained in the united kingdom so it's it's as, as far as i know i haven't practiced in the u.s uh, it's, it's slightly better because of something called european working time direct which basically try and put a cap on the amount of hours that anyone, and including doctors, can work in a week. However, when talking about neurosurgeons that would tend not to be that compliant, we still easily work 60, 70, 80 hours uh, in a week. And uh, yes, we do long hours and shifts. And it has happened several times of going on for 36, 48 hours and nonstop. Uh, but you get used. I mean, it's, it's anything. It's, uh, it's uh, training. For anything, there is a level of control and self-awareness where you're safe and you know where you're, you're not safe anymore. And that's that the point where you, you need to stop and ask for help and avoid do something similar the following time. Yeah. 
That's pretty cool. And then you said you were doing the PhD as well, and you went this academic route. You are working in University of Cambridge as well. So what is the intention behind that? Why not just go directly into neurosurgery? Um I mean, many people do, and, uh, and that's the, to be honest, is the standard path. You come out from medical school, usually age 20, like this is standard path, like age 23, 24. Then you get to a general medical program, which in the United Kingdom lasts three years. And then, and then you get to the residency, which is an eight year program. And then 10 years after, you are a, like at age 34, practicing the neurosurgeon. However, that's the standard. And many people decide not to go through the standard path. I personally did the first step for an half years of the program, of the neurosurgery program. Then I took what is called an auto program for research break, which is basically I halted my neurosurgery residency. I stepped out and I stepped in a PhD program while I was still covering what is called non rota, which is basically doing emergency work in neurosurgery just to keep my skills going. But Monday to Friday, during my normal day, I would be doing just research. And then finished the program, I stepped back in in the, res- the PhD program, stepped back in in the residency program and did another four years. And then another choice that people have at the end, and that's what I'm doing at the moment, is once you have finished your what is called general neurosurgical training that you can uh, sub-specialize or super-specialize and, and where basically you spend one year, one year usually in another unit either in the same country or in a different country and, and learn various like super-specialized techniques. Wow. And then you're lecturing as well. So you're teaching now all about this or what? Yeah, te- teaching is the thing that has suffered a bit. I used to be active in, in, in teaching medical students and being a clinical supervisor, but towards the end of the PhD program is the thing that uh, I had to let go. There were, it's, it's just impossible to do everything and, and uh, managing to focus in on the clinical side and the academic side and maintaining uh, something that uh, at least we can call work-life balance means the teaching as, as what the, the thing that suffered the most. So I still do occasional teaching. I'm involved in postgraduate teaching, organizing courses, for example, all the neurosurgeon, junior trainee, but I don't currently do regular teaching, for example, to medical students, PhD students. Although, I, I, of course, I supervise my own PhD students and people in the group, but I guess that's a slight difference. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Okay, I want to take advantage. Like I said, I think this is the first time that we've had somebody who's actually been digging around in the body. So what's that like? I mean, is it a lot of pressure to be implanting bioelectronic, biohybrid interfaces, bioelectronics? And what are some, I don't know, maybe crazy stories? And what, what's your specialization as well? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the when you operate someone, of course, it's a, it's a major responsibility. The patient is, most times, this, this procedure under general anesthetics, so the patient is asleep. So the patient is trusting 100% their life in your end. So the responsibility is massive. But of course, we get, that's why we get, we get through such a long training. So I'm saying that to, to get to the bioelectronics. When you operate someone that had a road traffic accident and come through the door and you just have to do something to save his or her life, or someone comes with a tumor and you know that either the tumor comes out or the tumor again will take the patient's life, there is a degree of, um, you know, you have to do this because that is life saving. When you start talking about bioelectronics and um, many other procedures, for example, to control epilepsy, to control pain, you go in, in something called quality of life operations, where basically the patient will still live if he doesn't have an operation, but of course, the quality of life will be affected. However, so if the operation goes well, that, that, that person will be much better, will have a much better quality of life. That's the aim. However, if something goes wrong, and always, and any operation that touches our body, but in particular our brain or spinal cord, things can go ter- terribly wrong. There is always the risk, including the risk to life. Then, then the pressure starts to build up because basically that patient didn't have to have that operation the patient, that, that, that pathology that would not take in that patient's life. So the pressure is there. But it's all a balance of benefit and risks. And this is really explained in, is in very great details to every patient that comes through the doors. Uh, they, they fully understand the benefits, but definitely understand the risks. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like, yeah, again, it's a, the cost benefit is much more on one side if it's a life-saving thing versus, yeah, like you said, quality of life. Hey guys, just a quick pause to talk about our show sponsor, Ripple Neuro and Neuromed. 
If you're a scientist looking to get the best quality data possible in your animal and human e-phys experiments, then talk to Ripple. Get a complete solution for your neuroscience research application backed by dedicated support. Be sure to tell them you heard about it on the Neural Implant Podcast. That will really help us out. Thanks. Now back to the show. And I guess you're suggesting this, but what's your favorite procedures and what's your least favorite procedures? <laughs> um, I'm not sure I have a least favorite procedure. The, my, um, my field of expertise is uh, functional uh, neurosurgery, peripheral nerve and uh, peripheral nerve surgery. And this is the field I am trying to specialize even further now between now and next year. The, the favorite procedures, to be honest, how all of them is that the, the, my favorite procedure is the procedure that works. And you see the patient after that uh, is, is a changed patient. The, the, we do, for example, uh, it's, it's a cool procedure that I only started doing now. I didn't practice during my training. And it really doesn't involve any active surgery per se. It's called something called MRI focus ultrasounds, which is basically the patient is awake. He's as, um, he goes in, uh, in an MRI machine, uh, the, the, the noise is scan, and the ultrasound are used to uh, lesion a small part of their brain. And these are usually patients that are not that cannot tolerate invasive procedures, and and they and one of the indication is a tremor. So they, this patient they shake to a level that they cannot feed themselves, they cannot care about themselves, and they go they come in the morning, they have this procedure two three hours, and in the afternoon you see them be able to take a cup by themselves and drink, which is something that they were not been able to do for decades. And uh, it's something that for us, we just give it for granted. You go to the kitchen, you put a glass of water, you drink it. Uh, for them, it's something extraordinary. And uh, you, you can see you just changed the life. And I can make such many examples. Uh, going from the epilepsy, when you make someone that it has to take several drugs and still having many seizures, many fits during the day. And then you do a procedure, I will go quite a few of them. And, uh, and then they come out and they don't have any further seizure. The life is... Uh, Completely. I wouldn't say that I have any least, least favorite procedures. They're all quite quite dramatic in the in the, in the change they produce in in uh, in people. Yeah, I think even if it's a maybe a procedure is very tedious or long or something like this, if you do see results like that at the end, then it might be all worth it. And I guess since you are at the front line and you don't really have a stake in this broadly, what are the uh, the percentage improvements? I don't know. Do fifty percent of patients see this kind of day and night improvement, or is it a hundred percent, or just your rough estimate? What what would you say? Um. Yeah, I think it, ch it changes to procedure from procedure to procedure, but uh, in general, this type of quality of life procedure really to be offered to the patients uh, will have to have a, a, 70, 80, a 70 to 80 percent improvement to justify the risks then uh, the patient will, will have to go through. The certain procedures are much better in maybe not, it is not an implant or electronics, but we do procedure, for example, for pain, for people that have a facial pain, and this procedure, which uh, basically is either uh, do an operation on the back of the brain where we decompress the one of the nerve or putting a needle through the face. They can uh, have a, uh, a, an outcome of almost 95% improvement. Another procedure, like for example, what I would say, there is a procedure that we do on the back of the spine for people with uh, neuropathic pain, in, uh, with pain uh, uh, and nerve pain in the arms, which has uh, yeah, an improvement of 70%. That probably is the lowest way of the, the, the one I mentioned before, for example, the, the MRI focus ultrasound, I think is in the range of 80, 90%. Deep brain stimulation, again, it's, which is one of the most uh, common is on the range of 80, 90 percent too. And the ones that like quote unquote don't work, is it just like zero effectiveness or is it even worse or is it just mildly better or what does that look like? So, so, some of these operations, they are perfect in uh, technically. Uh, you are happy with what you've done. You implanted the most perfect electrodes. You do scans to check that the electrode is in the perfect position, but then they don't have an effect on certain patients. So you always have uh, to quote this risk of, again, 10, 20% where this operation might not work despite technically being successful. And, 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 and we don't really know why it's not working because if we, I mean, there's definitely room for research there because if we knew that this was not going to work on the patient, then we would not do it. It's just uh, some patients are, are no responder, as, uh, as we call them. 
Yeah. Wow. That would be unfortunate to go through such an ordeal and uh, such a huge cost to not have it work. What are some risks other than it not working? What are maybe some damage or, or maybe even death? Is that a possibility? Have you ever seen that? I don't want to <laughs> get you in a hot water, <laughs> <laughs> admit to anything no, no. like, but uh, yeah, what, what's the worst that can happen? It depends from, again, operation to operation. For example, brain stimulation, what we could say to, to patients is that is uh, the, the risk uh, of uh, the device itself not working. So hardware failure, of of course, it's still you put a piece of equipment there, so uh, the equipment can always fail. The risk of uh, hemorrhage is uh, potential risk. It's not very high, and I personally haven't seen any significant one in my career so far or in the place where I'm, I've trained or training enough that caused damage or even uh, uh, life. But there are, uh, the, 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 there are reported cases in the literature where, yes, there has been catastrophic bleed in the brain, which caused death, but they are extremely rare. But so significant that you still have to make the patient aware that is uh, possibly theoretical, but still a possibility. One of the risks with any implants is infection. Infection is uh, it's uh, maybe not much dis discussed on the academic side, on the engineering side in terms of, of risk. But that's one of the most common and that th really affects the patient because, you, again, you go through a procedure which is quite uh, relatively invasive for the patient at least and works. And the patient has a benefits, again, there's a life-changing benefits. And then it comes a couple of weeks later with an infection that most times the only way to treat it is by removing the implant and treat it with antibiotics. And you can see how, the, how frustrating this could be to patients that had a glimpse of changing life and then they have to go backward due to that. And again, on the academic side, the managing infections is how to reduce infection in implantable electronics is uh, it's, I, I think in the service a bit more of a spotlight. Yeah, for sure. And what I heard too is that the devices, the infection can, I guess, climb or it walks along the device. So if you get an infection in one spot, eventually you would get it along the whole thing. So if you have a long, very long lead or something like this, then that just has a much bigger footprint. And um, it's much more dangerous to have a large device versus a small device. Is that kind of what you've seen? Absolutely correct. Most uh, most of these devices basically have an implant, implanted electrodes, which could be in the brain, uh, in the spine, or on one of the peripheral nerves. And then they have a lead, which is connected to what we call the IPG, an impulse generator, uh, which has got basically the battery as well. And usually the battery is the bit that uh, mo most commonly gets uh, uh, infected. So the clinical strategy usually is uh, removing the battery, trying to save the implanted electrodes, treat with aggressive antibiotics, and then reimplant the battery at the later stage when the infection is cleared. So that's one of one of the strategy. But you're completely correct. If then you leave the infection there, eventually the infection will travel through the leads up to the electrodes. And that is when things become dangerous because of course the infection might migrate inside the brain or spinal cord. Why does it mostly happen at the battery? Is it just because it's the biggest area or why? It's, I think it's interesting. And the theory behind um, some evidence, the, some of the evidence is, is probably is bigger. Uh, as you said, the bigger footprint. It's a bit more close to the skin than an implanted electrode would have. Uh, because the battery sit, tends to sit under the skin, basically, while the electrodes are implanted, for example, in the brain. And the infection, so there are two kind of two types of infection. There are infection that uh, might have happened at the time of surgery, where for one reason or another, some, uh, some of the microorganisms have uh, on, the, on, the, on the electrodes, and then infection kind of brew from surgery onwards. Or there are the infection that come after surgery, where basically are coming from the skin and go a bit deeper on the implants, and eventually what we call colonizing the implant and taking over. And, and I think this is actually the most common one, seems to be the most common one, and it, tends to, and it just tends to be on the battery probably because, again, it's bigger and closer to the skin. Yeah, interesting. Sounds like it might be good to have batteryless systems or smaller batteries. And it seems like you have a lot of experience with this. You could, you know, firsthand say what's good and what's not. Have you been involved in electro design, device design, or have you personally done it, or have you worked with people for this? Yeah, I mean, my, the laboratory I work in, uh, it, it's, it's one of the, the world experts in bioelectronics and it's led by Professor George Maliaras, that uh, you might know, 
uh, as an expert in uh, uh, neurotechnologies uh, and all the implant bi implantable bioelectronics. And as part of that lab, I, I have my research program where we work very much on spinal cord neural interfaces, peripheral neural interfaces. And as part of that, yes, we do, we go the full process. We go from the idea, the clinical needs, the design of the electrodes, to the electrical characterization, the implantation in, in animals, to then studies in cadavers, to study feasibility for you. So yeah, we try, we, our lab is quite fortunate to have kind of the entire pipeline from uh, kind of idea to implementation. Yeah, very cool. What are you working on now? You don't have to talk about any unpublished work, but what has been some <laughs> published things? Yeah, one, one of my interests in is something called spinal cord stimulation. Spinal cord stimulation is basically a way to, most commonly, to, to treat chronic pain. It's basically by delivering electricity to the posterior part of the spinal cord, so you can interfere with the pain signal coming from the periphery to the brain. And, and that allows to reduce the pain that the patient uh, suffers. I mean, that's in, in simple terms. There are different ways to deliver spinal cord stimulation, different type of frequency, voltage, etc. Uh, but it's basically delivering electricity to the spinal cord. And there are two types of, of electrodes that are used for that. There is something called paddle, which is basically a large electrode that requires an open spinal surgery to implant on the patient. And this has the advantage that covers a large area of um, the, the spinal cord. So, so giving uh, better pain relief, easier to, it's easy to deliver the electricity. And also it doesn't move around very much because it's large. It sits nicely there even when the patient is moving, walking, running, do all the normal activities. Uh, however, but, uh, the, it, it has the problem that you have to go through invasive spinal surgery. You have to remove bone from the from the spine to implant the electrodes. The patient needs to be under general anesthesia, etc. And then there is another electrode which is called the lead electrode or cylindrical electrodes, which is is basically a cylinder. And you can implant through something that looks like a, a lumbar puncture procedure, basically a needle inserting on the back with the patient, and, the, and this electrode is. Uh, pushed into the spine but by just doing x-rays where it will sit. Now, the advantage is you don't need, you don't need open spinal surgery and, and it's well tolerated. Uh, the disadvantage is because it's a small electrode, it's, it's, it's been more difficult to cover the area that, uh, to treat the sweet spots to control the pain. And also because it's small, it tends to move around. When the patient moves, there is something called uh, lead migration which is basically the, these electrodes moving around when the patient moves. And because when he moves, the pain relief might stop. Um, so lo long introduction to say that uh, what we've done is it's using uh, benefiting from uh, thin film electronics and uh, changing the way that these electrodes are manufactured so, to make them extremely thin and, uh, and then implanted in the microfluidics uh, inside them so that basically they can be rolled to look like the cylindrical electrodes be inserted via the lumbar puncture technique uh, of the cylindrical electrodes, but then navigated on the place of the spine that you want to. And then by inserting either air or water, the microfluidics makes the device unroll and becomes a paddle electrodes covering a large area of the spine with the advantage again to be more efficient and also stay in the place that uh, is, is meant to be without migrating. So that, that's, we published that work in, I think it was last year in Science Advances. We managed to have a patent published on that. And the, one of the biggest funders in the UK, the funder, the NIHR, has funded us with um, um, uh, 1.6, 1.7 million grants to take us to the next step. We'll go from the, our university prototype to a uh, industry um, a prototype, which can even impl then implanted first in human. Well, that, that's the thing that uh, is occupying most of my time at the moment. Wow, that's uh, that's fascinating stuff. Actually, that I'm looking at it. Yeah, this sounds like the best of both worlds, and you'll be able to, uh, yeah, be minimally invasive. Basically, just have the size of a needle that the body has to heal, but with the benefits of uh, spinal cord stimulation. Yeah, what kind of uh, what kind of results? If you want to summarize the. Um, the paper, is it as good as the paddle leads or is it, is there lead migration or, and then how many people did you implant all this kind of stuff? Uh, well, implanted, not yet. So the, the grant will take us to the, the so the, 
we managed to basically get the prototype. The, the grant is now going to take us to the, so we haven't planted anyone. That, that's the aim. That's to go first to human. But it, this will take some more work to have uh, what's called GMP products. The, the, it looks from, from the data that we have collected that basically is as good as a paddle electrodes. The aim was that. Essentially, a bit better even than the standard paddle electrodes. Uh, it's uh, completely non-invasive. So all the implantation we've done, both in animal and in in uh, cadavers uh, is as shown that is com- as easy as the implant as the cylindrical electrodes. So it, it requires no open surgery whatsoever. That's the beauty of it. One thing that's really fascinating about this project is the is how, how it came about. Is it, it came beca- because of uh, of the structure of uh, of the lab that has put together clinicians and engineers and uh, scientists, and then it was like full, completely why we say serendipity like in a break, in a lunch break, just talking about, so this is, there is this cool technology or there is this clinical need. need. And then the project just uh, just realized, the, in particular, George and uh, Chris Proctor, uh, who is the other uh, PI in the project, is been amazing to work with. This is fascinating stuff. Yeah, so tell us what's the what's the life cycle or what are the next steps? You mentioned this a little bit, but what's the is this going to be a company that, that you're going to be doing with this device design? And what is, I guess, a timeline for it coming into humans? I mean, it's a great question. And it's, it's been a journey for me, going from being a clinician to be an academic, and now, yes, exploring uh, the uh, the industry sides. Uh, the, the idea is, uh, yes, to uh, this to be, I guess it's the only way really to bring this product to the patients is by commercializing them. So the idea is that uh, now that with paper, patents, uh, and uh, the grants, uh, the next step will be to have a startup that uh, will lead the work and uh, to go first to human. So that is what we're working on. I have to say that in Cambridge, we are very fortunate. We got something called Cambridge Enterprise, which is basically the translation office uh, that uh, helps with helps from the invention to the IP to, to the commercialization. And they have been really helpful in leading us uh, through the process. So hopefully in the near future, yes, this will become a startup and, uh, and, and take this uh, technology forward. Wow. <laughs> so it'll be another five, 10 years before you start making money. So you'll be maybe 50, <laughs> 55 by the time you start making any money. Probably. But uh, th- th- a little, to be honest, uh, yeah, I-, I won't lie. Money is always sad. Uh, no, no one will ever say that they don't want money. But I came to the realization that as a clinician, you see at the forefront, you implant the devices that are already there are commercial. You see the difference at making patients. And then you become an academic where you come up with cool ideas or you work with people with cool ideas. And then you find yourself, then there is a kind of what they call the value of death of translation. And I say, how do I go from this cool idea that I know will make a huge difference in my patients to implant that in my patient? And that's where, where I'm, I'm focusing at the moment is how to bridge that value of death, which is the entire field of uh, translational medicine, translational surgery or translational neuroscience. Is how do you bring that cool idea to the patients? And the relationship with industry, starting from the startup to the big companies, it's fundamental. It's For a long time, there was this vision where the industries i wouldn't say the enemy the, even just a joke people will say oh the dark side it's which is completely wrong the industry is the necessary collaborator and friend and ally to really bring this technology from the university environment to the clinic yeah i think it's very much true and yeah you, you, you could be fighting it as a clinician but in the end you, you need them to for you to be successful too if you were to stay in that so that's really cool i think you get to see all portions of this you, you get to ha- get your hands dirty you get to see the edge i don't know academic side you get to see the i don't know business side yeah so for people maybe thinking maybe they're crazy maybe they don't want to work for 20 more years or, or something like this what would you recommend or what kind of advice do you have for them or what kind of takeaways do you have from your long career i i, I do enjoy and i do lots of mentoring to, to more junior I wouldn't say trainee from, from all parts of life and the reality is the beauty of neurotechnology is that it needs it's a multidisciplinary field and it needs people from different parts of life. So if someone is, is passionate, enthusiastic in neurotechnology, they just need to decide what they like about it and go for it. Of course, if they want to be practicing clinician and do my the way that I've done it, yes, it is the hard way. It is the longest way possibly. But yes, it does allow you that patient contact that has got its advantages. But much of my, much of my cool stuff I do with people that come from physics, material science, engineering backgrounds, where we really do 
lots of very cool innovation, the best conversation. And maybe that is a shorter path that allows you to do, to do the same thing and work on this, on, uh, as a team on, on this translation. Because again, the translation is not so done just by the implanted neurosurgeon. It's just, uh, to be honest, that is just probably the last is, uh, is necessary, but only the last, how would you say, the machine. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, but uh, it's, it, it is a group effort. Uh, you need uh, everyone involved. So it's, it's yeah, just uh, f- follow the passion and uh, get going and get involved in a good lab that can support you. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think it's a treat to to talk to somebody like you because neurosurgeons are notoriously difficult to get a hold of because they're very busy. To get your perspective is a rare thing. Yeah, I thank you very much. This has been great. No, thank you so much for inviting me. This is, is it's a rare opportunity for me too. And I really enjoy to bring out there what we do in the lab and uh, the work we do. I'm a bit hesitant to tell people if there's some way to contact you just because uh, you might be very busy. But if uh, people do want to contact you, how would they do that? But I'm very happy to speak to people, contact people. And then if they go to the my University of Cambridge page, my email address is there. So very much uh, available to everyone. Uh, people can feel free to contact me. One story I can maybe briefly tell is when we published the SES paper, the Minimal Invasive Spinal Cord Stimulator, I received... Um, couple of hundreds of emails from patients that were interested in technology. Of course, this technology is years away from being commercially available, implanted in human. But I took personal pride in answering every single of those emails, even just to tell them where we are and to thank them about the interest. And not a problem. If anyone wants to contact me, I will, I will, eventually I will reply. Wow, that's really cool. Damiano, thank you so much. This has been very good. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks, Adam. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.